Okay, hi everyone, thank you all for coming. My name is Sarah, I'm with the Student Animal Legal Defense Fund. I'm a member of the board. Uh, thank you all for coming again, uh, and we wanna give a special thank you to the Animal Legal Defense Fund and the Animal Law and Policy Program for helping to sponsor this event as part of Animal Law Week here at HLS. Uh, tomorrow, I just wanna note, we also have Sharon Nunez coming from Animal Equality. Um, so to begin, I'm gonna introduce David Carter who began his career in the NFL as a defensive lineman for the Arizona Cardinals in 2011. Uh, however, the sport began to take a toll on his body and one night in 2014, he decided to make a switch to a 100% plant-based diet after watching the documentary, Forks Over Knives. Since then, he has made a name for himself as the 300 pound vegan and has used his platform to help promote healthy plant-based dieting. Today, the former NFL player is an animal rights activist, film producer, and entrepreneur, and is here to talk about food deserts and the benefits of a meatless diet. So please join me in welcoming David Carter. Wow, thank you. Uh, this is a pleasure. Oh, this is loud. All right. So it's a pleasure being here today. Um, appreciate it. Thank you, Harvard and the animal law team for bring me out here and giving me the opportunity to share my story. So, uh, Impression in the Food System is the name of my presentation, and I'm gonna let you guys know how I got there. All right, so, does this thing work? Okay, so, I played for the teams, they, uh, okay, so I played for Arizona Cardinals, uh, the Dallas Cowboys, the Jacksonville Jaguars, and I played for all these teams. And let me tell you, go back a little bit, tell you, I started eating meat like everybody else. My family owned a barbecue restaurant in Los Angeles, California on Crenshaw and Adams, and the name of the place was called Leo's Barbecue. And growing up in a barbecue restaurant is pretty much like growing up in a butcher shop. It's the closest thing you can get to. You hocking, you know, chopping up pigs and ribs and all that stuff, you know, grinding up meat and all it's crazy. Not only to mention we had a farm in the south where our grandparents had, or my, our, our, our aunt had, and we used to, you know, plant fruits and vegetables and all that stuff, but we were killing chickens and plucking feathers and all that stuff, so it was real. Like, we grew, I grew up in a meat household. Like, at one point I was like, yo, I'm allergic to vegetables. Just give me the steak, give me the chicken, like, that's what it is. And it worked, you know? And it got me to where I was, where, you know, I got, ended up getting my brother and I, let me go back and tell you about my little brother, Chris Carter, he's a football player as well. We played to, we were on the same team growing up. Uh, you know, we, we both were like that, that same mindset, like vegetables, ugh, right? That's what we were. And it, but, and we ate meat, we were doing all that, and it worked for us. We got to where we were supposed to be. We were the, you know, star players on our high school team. We both got scholarships. I had 19 scholarships. My brother had 22 scholarships. Uh, he went to Fresno, I went to UCLA. Um, and, uh, what, right? Eight clap, all that. So, <laughs> so. And it, and it worked out for it worked out for us. You know, we were full ride scholarship, all that stuff. I was 300 pounds, but with 250 when I was in college, 300 by the time I got to the NFL, 305, right? And so, like I said, it worked for me. I got to the league. It's all good, all fine and dandy. But I started suffering from uh, I started like suffering from like tendonitis really bad to the point where it was it felt like somebody was taking a bat to my elbows or a knife in my elbows and just twisting it around just a little bit just to give you a visual what kind of pain I was dealing with and like it was hard for me to do push-ups it was hard for me to do bench press or do my job it was hindering my play I couldn't like lock my arms out and like you know go up against the guy I was going against without taking the pain pills that were being issued to me by the team which were a long list of uh, like pain killers anti inflammatories, uh, not to mention I was on, I had high blood pressure and, you know, at the age of 23, <laughs> like, and I actually in college too. So I was like, man, you know, something's got to change. Uh, so yeah, I was dealing with muscle fatigue or early onset arthritis, shooting pain, numbness, high blood pressure, tendonitis. I had all that at such an early age. And I, I considered them to be like, like, you know, my old man illnesses, you know, that's what I was dealing with. I'm like, what the hell? I'm 23 years old, I'm in the NFL. Like, I'm the one person, it's like literally like 0.14% of the people that go to the NFL or that make that play football actually make it into the NFL. And I'm dealing with all these old man illnesses. What the hell is going on, right? So I was like, nah, something's gotta change. So, you know, uh, 
I'm gonna go back. So I watched the documentary Forks Over Knives, and that's on Netflix. It was I was you know my my ex-wife at the time, or she was a wife at the time, ex-wife now. So, <laughs> but we were we were it was movie night. It was the February 13th, the day before Valentine's Day, and she tricked me and put on Forks Over Knives. And <laughs> <laughs> and I was literally drinking a milkshake at the time, right? And I'm sitting there drinking the milkshake like, what the hell am I watching right now? You know and I'm saying, what is this? And then there was a part in the documentary where they say, like, you know, uh, they go, where, where they tell you how milk and dairy products or animal products, just period, actually are toxic to the body, milk specifically, are toxic to the body. And the, the body's self-defense or defense mechanism is to leach calcium from the bones to neutralize the acidity in the blood. And that's why we have, we live in America, we drink the most milk, but we suffer from the highest rates of osteoporosis. Like, that doesn't even make sense. Isn't milk supposed to be good for, you, good for the body, right? Or have vitamin, you know, calcium and all this junk in it, but we're suffering from the highest rates of osteoporosis? Something doesn't add up. And playing football, you're clashing up against people all day, every day. Your bones better be strong as hell when you're going up against a 300-pound, 330-pound dude and he's running full force at you. You better hold up. So at that point, and, and not to mention inflammation. The, the dairy causes inflammation. Inflammation is your body's, it's, a, it's the immune system. It's trying to like, you know, that's your body's, it's a defense mechanism. It's inflammation. And to, you know, let you know what's going on. And tendinitis, when you break it down, tendon means joint. And itis is Latin for inflammation, right? So inflammation of the joints. If you take sand and put it in the door, in the door joint and you're moving it around, you know, you're gonna, it's going to be hard for your joint to work properly. And I'm going to get into that later. But uh, so uh, animal products send your body into an instant state of inflammation. So you drink milk or you eat meat and it sends your body into an instant state of inflammation for about three to four hours. And then you're, you, you, then you eat again three or four hours you, you, you're eating meat or you're eating cheese or dairy, you send your body into another inflammation rush, and then you're in this, you keep eating meat all day, which we do today in America, is we eat meat, eat meat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and midnight snack, or dairy, or something like that, or ice cream before we go to sleep. We're in a constant state of inflammation, right? So, you know, just quick back, so you know about that. So that's, so anyways, go back to the documentary. So I was like, man, so I'm causing uh -oh. I'm causing all of my old man illnesses. I'm, ki I'm killing myself. I'm putting myself on all these medications, these anti-inflammatories, high blood pressure medications at 23 years old, these painkillers, Celebrex, anti you know, Celebrex, and they came out with something saying that Celebrex causes ulcers and a long list of, you know, all these medications have a long list of side effects, like death and all that <laughs> stuff, right? So. You know, so I was like, man, something's got to change. I was drinking the milkshake. I remember I told you I was drinking the milkshake while watching this documentary. I was like, man, forget this. I didn't use forget. I used another word. I poured that down the sink, poured that down the sink and, and, my, and my, she's looking at me. She's like, what are you doing? And I was like, man, forget this, man. I'm going vegan. I'm going, I'm going. I poured everything out. I poured it down the sink. I went, I went to the refrigerator, and she's like, this man is for real. What is he doing? And I emptied out all the meat. I had lamb chops, steak, chicken, whatever. You know, it was all in there. Eggs. It was at one point, just before I was drinking eggs, because that's when my weight coach told me. I, didn't, I was like, oh, it worked for Arnold, so let me see what it, it worked for me. No, it didn't work. So um, anyways, I threw all that down and put it in the trash. And, and then she was like, you're serious about this? And I said, I'm going vegan tonight. I'm about to make a bean burger right now. I'm hungry. So I <laughs> made a bean burger. And the way I did it was, you know, because I was like, I don't want to be bored going into this, right? And, and, and I was like, so I'm just going to convert my current menu, you know, what I eat now, which is hamburgers, tacos, taquitos, nachos, burritos, all of these things, right? Uh, you know, whatever. And hamburgers, all of that stuff. And so I just took the meat out and I made lentil tacos. Or I put the, I t instead of cheese, regular, you know, not regular cheese, but cow cheese, I use cashew cheese, you know, and I just start switching things out and making these little bit of alterations in my meal plan, and it worked out for me. But I realized it's like, I mean, I felt good. I felt great. I was sleeping better within the first month. I was, uh, I, I was 305 when I started. The first month, I lost a month and a half. I lost 40 pounds, 45 pounds, and I wasn't even trying to. I told you I was eating burgers, and nachos, taquitos, <laughs> pizza, all of this stuff every day, right? And it, it, it. I felt great. I was like stronger. My bench press, I was only doing 315 for five, which wasn't a lot for me at the time, right? And so, 
like for a set of five. And then I went vegan and I lost weight. And I was like, man, I'm 265. But then I would go and hit the bench and I would be 465 pounds on the bench press. I'm like, shit, I'm good, right? <laughs> I mean, like, I'm like, I'm good. I'm swole right now. So that's what it was. That's what it was. And so I was like, well, fuck, I, I need to figure out how to put this weight back on, right? I need to figure out how to get this weight back on. So I was looking and there's a team called Plant Built Team and all these cats. And I was like, look at these dudes. They swole. They're not exactly the biggest dudes in the world, but they swole. And then you see uh, Patrick Baboumian, who's the dude from Germany. He's the strongest man in Germany. This dude's 300 pounds. This man's the strongest man in Germany and he's vegan. Now, isn't he like the strongest man in the world now or something like that? Strongest man in the world. You got Mixer Galaxy or whatever. He's vegan now. And all these dudes are swole. So I was like, man, if they could do it, I can do it. They're not exactly 300 pounds, but if they can get to 295 and they're not 6'5", 6'6", shit, I can do this right now. So I figured out how to do it. I reached out to these dietitians. I reached out to doctors and all of these guys and picked their brains and put a meal plan together and all that stuff. And I was like, okay. So I got to get 8,000 calories a day, 8 to 10,000 calories a day. So that's what I did, bro. 8 to 10,000 calories a day. So I called it Operation Weight Gain. Right? <laughs> and I was like, had my Vitamix. Shout out to Vitamix. Saved my life. Right? And so I would put everything in the Vitamix. Beans and, and like... <laughs> no, let, me tell you, let me go tell you about the beans. All right, so I would make fruit smoothies. I would put like, you know, strawberries, bananas. There was one point I was eating 25 to 50 bananas a day, literally, <laughs> because and then I would put them in like with smoothies. I would put them in like pancakes. I would do whatever. It was like 150 calories per banana and about uh, like 20 or 10 carbs. I forget what it is. Now it's been a while. But the carbohydrates in each banana. And I would put, I would put like four bananas in a smoothie. I would put a can of can of lily beans in there. That's 300 calories, 40 grams of carbohydrates, and uh, I forget it was like 50, 50, 45 grams of protein per can. Right. So I'll put that in there and I would put amaranth, I'll put hemp protein, I'll put brown rice, cook brown rice in there and I would make my own smoothies. Right. And, and I was doing that. And that thing would be like a thousand calories, fifteen hundred calories smoothie. And I'll just chunk that down. And so I was eating every hour and a half, every two hours and just doing that. Wake up in the middle of the night sometimes, because when you're sleeping at night, you sleep for eight hours. Essentially, you're fasting. So I would get up and I would drink a smoothie and I'd go right back to sleep, <laughs> right? And I put the weight, I put the weight on, I put on mad weight and I got up to 300 and, what was it, 317 pounds, 320 pounds was the heaviest I, got, I was as a defensive lineman playing in the NFL at nose tackle, which is the biggest position on the D-line, the biggest position on the, on the field, so as a vegan. So that's how that went down. And then... Uh, so another thing that I was going to talk about, this, right? Another reason why I went plant-based is the average age of death for football players is 56 years of age, according to a NEOS study done by the NFL and done with the, in, in collaboration with the NFL. And that's the average age. So that means cats are dying at a way younger age, right? And the reason why that happens is because, I'm going to go back, I don't want you to do that, I'm going to turn it. but the reason why that happens is because you know, when you're on the field and you're playing football, you're out there running four hours a day with pads on. When I was in Arizona, it was 120 degrees. We got pads on. I'm losing 15 pounds a day in water weight every day, right? And then I would go lift weights. <laughs> that's what we're doing. And so in real life, I, mean, that's not, I was doing it because I'm getting paid to do that, right? There's no way in hell I'm going to do that after I retire and play in the NFL. So I'm still – and, and what, we, what the players eat is, like, it'll be like – for example, two days before the game, they'll give us a box of church's chicken and like, you know, three piece of biscuit and some gravy. And it's like, that's not a good meal. They're like, how are you giving these professional top tier athletes chicken, fried chicken before the game? I don't make no damn sense. So players, this is how players are taught how to eat, right? This is how players, so because, you know, we're like, oh, if the, if the NFL thinks it's straight, then they got nutritionists, it's all good, it's gravy. No, right? So players eat after practice. I remember me and my boy, we would go to in and we thought we were eating healthy. Yo, know, let's go to In-N-Out and get four double doubles, bro. It's In-N-Out. It's, it's not as bad as like, you know, Jack in the Box or whatever. Bro. Yeah, it's just like, like, and the French fries are healthier. Like, come on, man. That was our mindset. 
And I was like, yeah, I'm hungry, so let me get, let me get five double doubles. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. That was how we, and that's how we did it, and we would replenish ourselves after a workout. But after you were done and you retire, that same meal, that same way of eating, it's, it's you know, we, we, adopt, we adopt a sedentary lifestyle, but we continue that same way of eating. And that's why players, when they're done, they retire, they blow up to like 300 pounds, 340, like a linebacker, 300 pounds, 340 pounds. Like I had a boy, and my boy, he was on the team with me at the Cardinals. He was 33 years old. He wasn't even big. Like he had abs and everything, but there's a thing called skinny fat when you eat healthy because you are what you eat, right? You don't eat healthy, but you have a high metabolism or you work out a lot and you, you look good, but your insides are all jacked up because you, you, know, you got all these hidden dangers that you don't even know about because you're, you're just eating whatever, right? This man had passed away. I was in a, I was, I was uh, on stage speaking in, in, in California at Cal State Northridge on the same topic. And my boy texted me. It was the three of us. We used to hang out tough all the time after practice. It's the three of us. He texted me while I was on stage. Hey, bro, uh, you know, he, he passed away, bro, in his sleep. He was living in the Bahamas with his wife and his two children, his two little babies. Passed away a massive heart attack in his sleep. But this is not a rare occurrence. This is all the time this stuff is happening. And it's not just happening to football players, it's happening to the general population as well. The average age of death is a lot, is, is lower than what it should, it's like, come on. The average age of death for the general population is like 60. That's crazy. And people are dying of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, uh, obesity, all of these things. These are on the top 10 list of killers. Why are the top 10 list of killers riddled with food-related illnesses and nobody knows anything about how to eat better, right? And that's because of this slide that I've been holding back from y'all for like the last 10 <laughs> minutes, right? So, <clears throat> and so um, the doctors go to school for the better part of 10 years. And they go to, they go to school for, to, to learn how to heal people, right? And learn how to make us better and get us, you know, oh, you're sick? Oh, okay, that's what you're gonna do. But they just hand you medication. You know that, that when you go into a doctor's appointment and you spend there, by law, they can only spend 15 minutes with you. You can't diagnose anybody in 15 minutes. What the hell? What, you gonna just put a stethoscope to my chest and you gonna know the whole problem in my whole body? No, wrong. What are you doing? You're just selling. I'm not, not going to get into that later. You're selling that. <laughs> so, and so, like, how, so if, we're, if doctors don't know how to make us better, like when you ask a doctor, they'll just tell you, say, what do I do to get healthier? How can I get rid of this diabetes? How can I lose weight? Eat cleaner. How vague is that? What? Eat cleaner. And then when you look at the doctor, the doctor don't look like nothing his damn self, right? <laughs> so it's like you can't, you can't take advice from him or her, who, you know, whoever the doctor is. So it's like... You know, you have to be careful. That's why you can go. I go on the doctor. I have debates with doctors all the time. They be trying to get me. Well, people are living longer because of medicine and pharmaceutical medicine. Like, okay, they're living longer, but what's the quality of their life when they're taking these pills all day that cause them to take other pills and they're spending, the average person spends $8,000 a year on, on medication, right? So they're spending all that money on that and then they feel like shit in the morning. They can, before they get up out the bed, they got to take the pills just to get started on the day. Otherwise, they're going to die or they're stuck on this medication their entire, their entire life. They have to take every single day because their doctor says so. Now they got a medication where you can't eat green vegetables with it. What kind of shit? What kind of, what is that? So it's like, it's, like it's, it's, a, it's a business, it's a corporation. We have to take that into consideration. Uh, I'm gonna definitely get into that later on in the speech and let you guys know what's going on. And this is what I'm talking about right here. The lead, this is the, lead, the CDC's top 10 list of killers. You can see cancer, chronic lower respiratory disease, that's inflammation in the lungs. That's, all, that can, that could be, that's considered food related because inflammation, I told you, animal products send your body into a constant state of inflammation. You have strokes. Alzheimer's is also, they're doing studies to show that Alzheimer's is inflammation in the brain. And, you know, the brain is part of the body. And if it's inflamed, you know, diabetes is caused by saturated fat. And that number is a lot higher now because this is a study from 2015. That diabetes is number like two or three now. So, this, so diabetes is higher. Diabetes is also the number one killer in Mexico. Um, and like, I mean, you can just go down the list. And this is the, the top 10 killers in the world. The, I mean, the world, but in the United States, and it's the same. So when we're talking about disease, like I told you guys earlier, I like to hyphenate words because it defines them. Disease, heart disease, like heart disease, or, um, you know, um, inflammation of the joints, tendonitis, all of that, like heart disease. So you, you, have to, you have to take those words and hyphenate it. If your body can't, your heart is just a muscle, right? 
Oh, oh, all right. Your heart is just a muscle. And, you know, say for example, I put a five pound weight in my hand and I'm going like this all the time. Go like this, five pound weight. Eventually, and I don't care how strong you are, that muscle is going to get tired. It's going to wear out, right? With heart disease, it's like cholesterol. The only place you can find cholesterol is in, is in animal products, right? Cholesterol is what blocks your arteries. It blocks your neurological arteries going to the brain, which causes stroke. Uh, so going back to the heart. So the cholesterol goes to the arteries, blocks the arteries, and your heart's pumping and has to work extra hard to, to pump blood through the rest of your body. And since it's making, working extra hard to pump blood through the rest of your body, your heart can't function with ease, hence the term heart dis-ease. That's why, you know, uh, when fat surrounds the heart, saturated fat surrounds the heart, and it's restricting the heart like a bunch of rubber bands, your heart can't pump blood to the rest of your body with ease, hence the term heart disease. So this is, and that goes, and that goes for every part of your body, right? If your body can't function properly, then you have a disease, and that's your body. You have pain, you have, you know, whatever the issue is, and that's where you have a heart attack because your heart's just tired and just goes kaput and dies. It's just a muscle, right? So, and the, like, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. This statement is so true. It's so loaded. Right? So when, you, when they do autopsies on people or when they do liposuction on people, they could take the fat and put it under a, tele, a microscope and they can see what kind of animal you've been eating. If you've been eating beef, pork, chicken, because the animal fat, when you eat it, it doesn't break down properly because we don't have the enzymes in the stomach acid to break it down properly. So it goes right here, wherever, you know, where you don't want it to be, right? And that's where it goes. And that's why, so, you are what you eat, so they could see if you've been if you eat mainly beef, pork, chicken, whatever. Like so, the fat you eat literally is the fat that you're wearing because you're taking the fat from another animal and you're putting it into your body. When you cook a steak, or your doctor says eat lean meat, eat lean chicken, whatever, eat lean beef. That's some bunch of BS. You you can you can chop all the fat off. There's still fat on the inside. It's marbled in there. You cook it. The fat's dripping off. This, that, and the other. You're taking the fat of another living animal and making it a part of you. Do you guys want that fat in your body? Do you want that to be a part of you? Hell no. Everybody's taking weight loss pills. You got these New Year's resolutions that nobody's really meeting because they're adding this shit right back into their bodies again. It's counterproductive. Your diet needs to be like residual income, and that's not. People are adding things into their body that is hindering their progress and what they want to look like, how they want to feel, how long they want to live. That's just what it is. This is a heart. This is the, the slide I was telling you about heart disease. When you eat that, when you eat the stuff, it surrounds your heart, makes it hard for your heart to pump. Those arteries get clogged up, and then the cholesterol makes it hard for your heart to pump blood to the rest of your body with ease. Heart disease. I'm not a doctor. Y'all can look it up for yourself. <laughs> Erectile dysfunction. <laughs> right. This is <laughs> it's real. So let me tell you why. All right. So. The, the smallest artery in the human, I just told you about cholesterol and the arteries being blocked by cholesterol, right? The smallest artery in the human body is the one going to your reproductive organs, right? So what's the, what's the, what, when do people start getting them, like people are taking these blue pills left and right? And probably some of y'all are probably taking them in this room right now. <laughs> just keep me real. So, <laughs> so when we talk about it, like the blue, so when you, so the cholesterol is blocked, and it blocks the blood from blocking that small, the smallest artery in the human body going to your reproductive organs. It's stopping it from the blood from flowing there and, you know, getting, getting shit flowing, getting shit doing your thing, right? <laughs> so when you look at Viagra and Cialis, what these, what these medicines are and how they came to the market, it explains everything. These, these medicines or these, these drugs are vial And what a vial does is it expands the artery, allowing blood to flow through the, re through, you know, to the right places, right? And, you know, it was, an originally, it was originally started as a heart medication for heart, so as like replace for stents and stuff like that, get the blood flowing. And that's why they recommend Viagra and Cialis for people who have heart issues and things like that. So when they started it, it was like, oh, this is a great heart medication that we have on the market. And they were doing the test trials and they were handing out pills to all the, the guys and they're doing it. And all of a sudden these guys stand up and they're walking around. They just got to, they just got to, you know, they, they just, they got wood and they're like, oh. 
this is great sales and you can sell this, sex sells. And so that's what happened. And, that, and the same thing goes for women. The smallest artery going in for the human body is the one going to the reproductive organs. That's why they're coming out with these Viagra for women now because all it's doing is opening up the blood flow right back to your ovaries and to all your, your whole situation, right? And that's just what it is. So, you know, we have to take that into consideration. You can avoid erectile dysfunction by eliminating by, um, by, by eliminating cholesterol animal products from your, bo from your body, from your meals, from your, your, what you eat. Um, yeah, so this is another thing. These are hot dogs, cigarettes. According to the World, Horth, the well, uh, World Health Organization, the WHO, uh, processed meats are considered a class one carcinogen, right up there with cigarettes. Uh, three hot dogs is, considered, is, is equivalent to smoking a whole pack of cigarettes. Right. And people are out here giving hot dogs to their babies because they don't have time to cook, you know, and especially in, in like uh, more underserved areas where I'm from. They don't you know, you don't have many options. Hot dogs, are your number one go to. I can't I can't even count how many hot dogs I ate. It was crazy. Right. So and now that I know what they are, I'm like, Ugh, let me uh, purge my body. I'm going to go vegan. All right. And so that's what happens. And you, we have to be aware of that. And these companies are like. They're not going to tell you that they were, you know, they, they're not going to tell you that their their product that they're selling you is a class one carcinogen, you know. That's not it, that's not good business for them. Where is that? So yeah, here we go. And then we talk about diabetes, right? So I was telling you about, about diabetes, and in, in my in my community, my culture, we consider we refer to diabetes as the sugars, but. And diabetes isn't caused by sugar. I don't know how many med students we have in here, but diabetes has been proven has been called to be caused by saturated fat. The saturated fat is only found in animals. Like when you drop a chicken in the pot and the fat rises to the top and you can scrape the fat off the top, it hardens. That's what saturated fat is. Or oils that harden at room temperature, hydrogenized oils that harden at room temperature, like Crisco, which is conveniently found in the hoods, right? So in inner city areas, so y'all don't know what the hood is. All right, so <laughs> diabetes goes right to your pancreas. Excuse me. Diabetes goes right down to your pancreas where your beta cells are stored. And your beta cells are what create insulin. That saturated fat goes right down to the pancreas, to the pancreas and goes down to the, be the beta cells like a heat-seeking missile, surrounds them, and chokes them out, preventing them from making insulin. And that's why, you know, that's when you become hypertensive or diabetic, or whatever, not hypertensive, hyperglycemic, hyper, whatever. You become diabetic. UCLA just released a study showing that 50% of California is pre-diabetic, and they don't even know it. So, it's like, and because we refer to it's, it's miscommunication, miseducation on what the, what it is and what the disease is and why your body's not functioning with ease, it's it's like a parallel. It's like, oh, it's, we're going to blame it on sugar. We're going to coin this as the sugars. When your blood sugar level rises up, you know, then you have diabetes. But it's not your blood sugar level; it's your insulin levels being pushed down because you're eating saturated fat. So it's like a misdirection type deal. So. Like I said, I'm not a doctor, but y'all can look that up. So what is food oppression? Food oppression is basically when everybody's not getting the same thing, right? Somebody, we're getting different food than this, this community is getting different food than this community, and where does it stem from, right? So you guys can look, just structural perpetuation of race, class, based health crisis. Y'all can read that for yourself. This is Harvard. So <laughs> <laughs> like, government, federal food policies, all of that stuff. So a lot of people don't know where our food system comes from, or what food, I'm gonna get into that later, but we have this thing and we see, you guys are, are you all familiar with food deserts or food swamps? Oh, I love Harvard, all right. We're familiar with food deserts and food swamps, but when you look at what the term, the word desert, like what is a desert? When you think a desert, you think of like tumbleweeds, cacti, you know, dry land, you know, dirt, you know, all of that stuff. But you don't think of you know, communities, buildings, and all that stuff. That's not a desert. These are, these are systematically underserved areas that have been, like I said, coined. And we, we claim, like, oh, like, where did these food deserts come from? They're so unfortunate. They have a, they have a birthing place. They have somewhere where they came from. And it, you know, these are geographically placed. This is, this is somebody set this up. Somebody said, we're not going to put grocery stores in this community, but this community over here, we're going to put a whole bunch of grocery stores because they need to eat healthy. But they don't need anything over here. These are just people. They're just working. They're not doing nothing. That's what that is, right? And like these food swamps. Like how did it turn into a food swamp? 
There's, you got, we, have, we can get food there. Like a truck can go there, a truck can go there. Why, why is there no food there, you know? And so a lot of people don't know that our food system was created from Jim Crow laws. Everybody familiar with Jim Crow law in this room? Sort of? All right. So Jim Crow law is, <laughs> Jim Crow law is the whole thing where it was like, you know, uh, whites only restrooms, whites only restaurants, um, no blacks, Mexicans, Indians, or dogs allowed in the restaurant. Like, straight up, that's what it was, right? And it was, the, it was segregation in America. That's how they did it. And here goes a picture right here. And now and they came up with these things called zoning laws. They're called zoning laws now. But originally, they were called uh, Negro zoning laws in 1910. It started in Baltimore around, my, around John Hopkins University. And, and that's where the practice came up, right? So, and it's basically, you know, Separating, separating resources and, how, and determining how resources are allocated from community to community, right? So, and, and now, and then all the studies show that the areas with unhealthy food that are subject to these unhealthy food and these food deserts or food swamps, what they're coining it, you know, really when it's just a systematically underserved community, or underserved area, that's what they need to call it. These areas are, the, the, the levels of diabetes and health issues and medication and all that stuff are sky high in those communities because when you eat what you have available to you, you know, especially if you don't have a car or something, like you live in New York, most population of New York doesn't have a car. So you gotta take the bus to the, get, to the, to the grocery store. And then that's like, since the grocery store is five miles away, three miles away in New York, that's a journey, right? You go into the train and you go, you, to get back on the bus, you can, you're only allowed two grocery bags on the bus. So you go, you're traveling an hour and a half to the grocery store, you do your shopping for your family, you get back on the bus, you can only take two bags on the bus, they're not gonna let you on. It's like, that's a setup, right? How am I supposed to feed my family with two bags of groceries? You know, like I gotta go back again to the grocery store and get two more bags of groceries? Anyways, moving on. So Negro zoning laws. So like I said, originally our food system was called Negro zoning laws, and that's what they used to determine how, all right, we're gonna put the communities of color over here, we're gonna separate it with these industrial buildings right here, and then we're gonna have the more affluent communities over here, and we're gonna put like healthy foods and all that stuff over there. We wanna keep the character up. These are actual terms that they use. We wanna keep the character up in these communities. And then, you know, eh, eh. And then that's what it was. And it was 1910, it was Negro zoning laws. And in, 19, in 1917, they deemed it unconstitutional because the, the title was racist. So we're changing it to racial zoning laws, <laughs> right? And so we're changing it to racial zoning laws. And then in 1930, they deemed it unconstitutional again because it was still, they were like, oh, it's still a racist title. But they never changed anything about the actual law in itself and how it was structured, relocating, uh, you know, um, the, the resources, the alloc allocation of resources between communities. It was just like, uh, we're just gonna rebrand it and you know, we're gonna change the name. And then this part right here is a little problematic right here where it says black, Asian, Native American, indigenous people. We're gonna take that out and put, we're gonna put blight right there. And blight it it means infestation, mildew, and mold. So they're referring to people of color as infestation, mildew, and mold. Now, I'm not, you know, hey, you guys can look this up in any real estate book, in any, and that there's proof there. Um, I mean, it's all there. I mean, you can look at this, the history of our country. Like, that's just it's what it is, and this is where we are now. And, you know, we gotta make some changes because we can't keep it up like this. So, um, now we have to delve deep, we have to delve deeper into this because there's, it's, it's layers to this, it's layers to this, right? So like we're talking about targeting, right? The targeted marketing. So there's a Yale Rudd study that uh, like all of these companies, they're, tar they're, they're targeting to the youth because they consider the youth to be trendsetters, the youth of color to be trendsetters. Like, you know, because we dance and you know, we got the clothes and we're playing sports and football and all these things and we were making all the music, all that stuff. So they're like, they're, they're trendsetters and everybody's following them. Like, and now, you guys, I'm sure if there are business people in here, business corporations are hunting down culture to sell their product. They're trying to, you know, everything is about culture now. You guys see it, it's not, it's, you're not blind. Y'all are smart, it's Harvard. So they got the, and, and they consider us to be tremendous brand ambassadors. Like, for example, they, they got milk and they'll put, uh, 
you know, um, Nelly or whoever, and they'll have them with a milk mustache on, when 70 to 100% of people of color are lactose intolerant. I don't even make any sense, right? And so, you know, and then we have the, they exploit celebrities of color, so I'm talking about targeted marketing and then the zoning laws. And they use zoning laws because in the, the fast food restaurants, that's another thing, they're tiers. They break it down into tiers, tier one, two, three, and four. Tier one will be the more affluent areas, like this Harvard area, where you guys don't have any fast food restaurants. I haven't seen no McDonald's or no Taco Bells or anything like that around here. This is zero, right? But then you have tier two, and there'll be one or two McDonald's there. You have tier three, it'll be five or six, and then you have tier four, which will be your urban community, in, in like South Central where I'm from, and there'll be Taco Bell, Burger King, McDonald's, Subway, and this is one street corner. And it's consistent, it's like that throughout the entire community. So, and I implore you guys to, you know, hop in the car and take a drive to your nearest hood or your nearest, you know, get, you know, and look for yourself. You don't need, you don't need me to tell you, you can see this with your own eyes. And then count how, count the, how many grocery stores. I was living in Beverly Hills last year and living right next to the Beverly Center. And I walk out of my house, walk to the right, Trader Joe's, five minute walk, walk to the left, Trader Joe's, totally different Trader Joe's, to the left, five minutes. And I'm like, I'm like, what the hell? Like, I'm like, can we take one of these Trader Joe's and put it in this community right here? Because they need fresh fruit and vegetables too at a discount price. Trader Joe's got the best prices. But you don't see them in the areas where people need those prices. Because what they're doing is they're pricing people into the unhealthy foods and pricing us out of the healthy foods. That's why a vegetable costs more than a damn burger. But a burger is, somebody's, is, is an animal's life, somebody's life, right? And, the, and the, the process that it takes, it takes more water to make a burger, it takes more time, it takes resource, all of that to make a burger. But it costs less than a cucumber? It costs less than, a, than an organic cucumber? Like, what the hell? Come on now. It's like, we gotta, we gotta put these together and see what's going on and why it's happening. And here goes like, this is back to the marketing. You have the general marketing. That's right here. And this is just regular marketing that they do for the regular popular people, you know. Huh? You know, it's, it's, you know, we're not targeting nobody. But then, this is what targeted marketing is. You have the, the people of color in there. You got them dancing and they're singing. And like Church's Chicken commercial, they have a, the lady, love that, or the Popeyes, love that chicken from Popeyes. You got a gospel choir behind her using religion. And I'm like, you guys ain't got, no, y'all ain't holding nothing back. Y'all got y'all put God into this and Jesus? Like, come on now. <laughs> and then, so it's like, <clears throat> excuse me. And there's a, the Yale Rudd study that I was telling you about earlier. It's not Yale, it was originally Yale Rudd, but now it's the Yukon Rudd study. And they use it to, and, and, and it, in there it explains how uh, these fast food companies and this Pepsi and Pe Dr. Co Pepsi, all these whatever sugary drink companies, they, they released a study in 2015 stating that. 85% of their net profit from the year 2015 to the year 2020 is going to come from marketing to youth of color. So it's like, goddamn, that is a lot. That's like all of your income, everything. Like y'all, it's coming from marketing to youth of color. Then you look at television or you look at uh, television networks like BET or Telemundo. 86% of their commercials are fast food commercials or Pfizer or these kind of restaurant, or, I mean restaurant, these kind of drug companies like that in marketing to these demographics. But when you turn to like, you know, HGTV or whatever, these commercials, they're targeted. They're sending, they're reaching out to this demographic so they can sell their product because where are all their brick and mortar stores? In urban communities. And not here at Harvard, they're in these urban communities, right? And so, and then this, this is McDonald's. This is how deep they go. So McDonald's, for example, they, they sponsor every single black event that you can think of. They sponsor the, all the HBCUs. They sponsor the BET Awards. They sponsor, uh, what else? The basketball, all that basketball stuff. And, and the, like they have websites that are specifically targeting each demographic. My inspiration, really? Me, me and Kanta, 365 black. Like, this is crazy. And on, each, on the website, every day they put a different celebrity of color on there talking about, like, oh, how this is great. On the 365 black one, they had Keith Sweat. I don't know if y'all know who Keith Sweat is. He was on there talking about chicken nuggets are the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm like, no, it's not. Get, get out of here with that mess, man. Come on now. So, 
Is, so, like, and this is what I'm saying, the sponsoring the BET events, like I said, no holds bar. They're doing gospel events. Like, it's crazy. So we have to, like, it's like, we, it's, you have to see what's going on. You know, it can't be out of sight, out of mind. You have to see the differences. Because they're targeting you, they're, they're hitting you with different information. You know, they're not going after y'all because y'all, we're, we're shopping at Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, we're going to the grocery store. It's right down the street. I'm not going to eat McDonald's. It's not even over here. I don't want to drive down to, 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 the, to the, that area over there. You know? And so, like, uh, yeah, like, and that's what I was telling you about the Yale Rudd study and then this television and all that stuff. 86% of commercials and Spanish speaking television is, or fast food commercials and all of these things. So that, that I share with you, and I'm going to move on past that. And this is a study by Dr. Milton Mills of Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And he's a, a black doctor, and he did the study. And this shows that 75 to 100% of people of color are lactose intolerant, or lactose tolerant, because like most of the people in this world can't really drink milk. That's why lactate milk is such a big seller, right? And now almond milk is, a, is like, and, and, and plant milk is just wiping them out and taking over everything because everybody's lactose intolerant, right? And then when you look at this list, though, the, the lighter you get on the scale and the skin color, you know, it gets to like, like I say, like East Asian, 90 to 100% lactose intolerant, indigenous uh, people, 80 to 100%, Central Asian, 80%, African, you know, African American, 75%. But then when you go to like Italian, 20%, 20-70%, French, 17% lactose intolerant, Finnish, 17%, you know, British UK, 5% lactose intolerant. And you see how it's like, it, it's, you see kind of what's going on with the study and where it's going. And it's like, when you see the introduction of the milk law, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the milk law, they use that when, they, when the country was like, we're, in, we're at the war and they're like, oh, we're too sick to fight. We need to beef up. We need to get big and strong. So what they did was they did, they introduced the milk law and that was in Baltimore as well. But the way that they introduced it was into communities of color. But communities of color are 70 to 100% lactose intolerant. So that's like chemical warfare and poisoning that community and getting them big and fat. And it's like, you didn't need to use milk. They do the same thing overseas in Europe, and they use beer. Why don't we do that? I would love that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like we, and it doesn't, it's, and, it, and it's just the same, for, and they did it for the same reasons. Like, we need to bulk up. We need to get fit. And so they use beer because of the carbohydrates and the, and the, and the calories that it has, and it gets the thing, it gets what it needs to be done. And they're serving it to kids. And beer is way better than milk. <laughs> right. And so, like, uh, leading cause of, death of the, uh, cause of deaths in Mexico are all food-related illnesses. And, and this is, and so it's like, like I said, the number, like heart disease is number one, and then diabetes is suit, is following suit. So like, and it's changing because everything's changing so rapidly, right? So it's crazy. So now when you look at the history of Mexico and the Americas, you have to look at colonization and how that took place, right? Before Christopher Columbus came to the Americas, there were no cows, no pigs, no chickens here in the Americas. So that means there was no eggs, there was no milk, there was no cream, there was no butter, none of that shit, right? And, but when he came and colonized the lands, he brought all of these things with him. Because when you, when you come to colonize, you bring three things. You bring your culture, you bring your religion, and you bring your food. So he brought all of that, and, it, and the cows ate the native, the Indians, the indigenous people out of their, their house and home, ate the, the, all of that stuff, and they, were, you know, ate in, and they were put on the reservations. And then they were forced, that food was forced onto them. And when you look, I spoke in Mexico a couple times last year or here before, and the Mayan people, they took me in and they told me how to make corn tortillas, right? The original corn tortillas, and they told me about the history of their food. And they were like, when you look at, when you look at original tacos, there's no meat in it. Even the ones that they try to claim as original tacos, they just have meat and cilantro on the top of it. But before then, there was no meat in there because we didn't have any meat. We didn't even have cows, pigs, or chickens here. So all we used were potatoes and peppers. And, and, you know, and, that was, and we put a little bit of insects on there from time to time for like protein and some crunch or whatever. I was like, OK. And, but, <laughs> but that's what it was. That's just what it was. That's what they ate back then. And then today, you see what's going on and how much, you look at Mexican cuisine and they got cheese and queso and tres leche and all that stuff. But we're, that, none of that was part of it before colonization, right? And then you look at Mexico and you look at bullfighting. There were no bulls here before the Spanish came to the, to the Americas. 
So all of this is just colonization, right? And, and, and it's still, and it's perpetuated and it's still here today in 2018, full effect. And it's doing this thing. And you look now, and it's, you know, you see like that all the communities of color are the number one people dying of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, so on and so forth. So this is just chemical warfare playing out in food, right? And like, so, and then for in in the black culture, you know, soul food's been killing black folks since since it, since it came right. So and I'm gonna tell y'all like where soul food came from, right? And it's like. Soul food is essentially slave food, right? It was given to us by the slave masters, and you know the pig's feet, the ear, the chitlins, what are really called the shit, shitlings. That's what they shitlings. It's the intestine. You have to clean the shit out and then boil it. The whole house smells like ass. It's not good, right? And and, and so like this is just what it is. Like the feet and you pickle it. This is and the reason why we got these from the pig and from the cow, the leftovers. They didn't want it. We, that's all we had to eat. We were forced to eat it. It took them like 10 years to get them to force us to eat this. And we created, uh, we took it, the leftovers, all that we had, and we made it beautiful. We made it into something that we could tolerate, right? Because nobody wanted to eat it. So we had to change it and morph it. And we cooked it and deep, deep fried it in oil and butter and, and sugar and, and added all that stuff to sweeten it and make it taste better than what it was. And that's how we came up with soul food. But then soul food is not good for you. It's killing people. And this is addition to why people of color, black people, are the number of people dying from heart disease, stroke, and diabetes, and all of these things. You know, it, you know we got the leftovers, and everything was, un, it was unappetizing. And so now, you see, like back in the day with slavery, we were the number one people. We were out there working 17 hour days, you know, eating one meal, get back up there, go pick a whole hundred bags of cotton, and then, you know, go to sleep on the, on the floor, get back up and do it again, working hard, right? And then, but now it's 2018, a couple hundred years later, we're the number one people dying of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes when nobody paid nothing for us because it's like <laughs> we're going to die at like 50. 50, 60 years old because of the foods that we've been eating and the food system that we are um, victim help, you know, we're, that we're in today. So this is what I was telling you about lactose intolerance. 75% of the world's population is lactose intolerant because 75% of the world are people of color. So, uh, and like, we got this. <laughs> <laughs> McDonald's, you know, they love the kids. They're trying to sell you this meal. It was like, it's all great and that's all fine and dandy, but do you want your children to eat all of this stuff? Eating McDonald's food? You've seen that stuff? You've seen these videos about McDonald's and how, you know, you leave it. If somebody left a hamburger under their car for 14 years and they found it and they, oh man, it still looks the same. You know, it's like, and this is real. Like, they got, they, they put them in and it looks the same. It doesn't, it doesn't like spoil because it's not food. And this is what we're feeding our kids. McDonald's french fries have 11 different cancer-causing ingredients in them alone. And this is what we're feeding our children. And this is because it's all that's available to us. And then what I'm saying, though, is like with the groceries. Oh, so what I'm saying is like grocery stores and stuff like that. And where you guys come in is like this. It's like, I don't know. We're not people. You're not racist. But let me tell y'all is this. If I beat somebody up and you sit there and you watch it happen and you don't say shit, then you're complicit. You are a part of this crime. If I kill somebody and you sit there and you don't say anything, you're complicit. You're a part of this crime. If you are shopping in these grocery stores and, and you know that you're getting special treatment in your grocery store in your community where you live and how the food system was started, and, and, and these, this community over here, not far down from the street, four or five miles away from you, doesn't have any food, I'm gonna go over here to my grocery store right next to my house. You're complicit to this system of, of, of racism, that's what it is, let's be real, of this systemic racism that's, that's still active today in 2018, you're, you're, you're contributing. And that's just what it is. Just being real with y'all. So, you know. This is people going, moving forward. Uh, I was kind of deep, now. <laughs> moving forward is, it's like, you know, people ask me all the time, like, yeah, what do you eat? What do you eat? Uh, where do you get your protein from? Well, a cow is 2,000 pounds. They don't eat any meat. They, they're, they're fine. Uh, gorillas, <laughs> uh, gorillas don't eat meat. They can bench press a car. Elephants are like 6,000 pounds, or I don't know how big they get. They don't eat any meat. So I just get my meat from the same place, my protein the same place they get their protein from. 
and I'm cool, right? And so, and so like the vegan hamburgers and this, that, and the other. And that's my presentation for the day. And I really want to thank you all for listening to me. And it's been great. So anyone who needs to take off and make a 1 o'clock class can do so now, but we've got the room to 1.30, and we can take some questions for as long as you have them. Thank you. All right, cool. Uh, so you said that shopping at the stores is complicit. What, are, what do you think the solutions are to getting the grocery stores where they need to be? Well, grocery stores, and let me tell you all a little about grocery stores. I did a project with Ralph's Grocery Stores and Kroger and them for a while, and you can see how the food is on the tier system as well in their organization. And you have the Ralph's Fresh Fair, which is like a Whole Foods. You have the Ralph's, and then you have the Kroger. It's a tier system. And then you have the Food for Less, which is in the hoods. And they don't have any fresh fruits and vegetables. They just have like whatever's left over. I was talking to my mom about it the other day. They're like flies and stuff, like flying around the fruit. And then like, or like you go to the bodegas, and there will be the leftovers from the grocery store. And it's literally on a shoe rack is the fruits and vegetables section. I, I, and I took the slide out, I don't, know, I don't know why I did, but I went and took pictures of Baltimore of all the fruit and it was literally a shoe rack or an old freezer that they were like, oh, we're gonna put the fruit in there. And they were complicit, like these grocery stores, they use the tier system as well to distribute their food throughout the country. And, you know, cause they're like, well, we're gonna sell the healthy fresh food here. And then once the start, food starts to deteriorate, we're gonna sell it in these communities. So like we're in complete, but what we need to do is to avoid that. And like you're saying, complicit is education. We need to educate each other. Cause it's, it's the thing is, it's not, like I said, y'all are not, y'all not racist, but you are not aware of what's going on. You know, you were you uh, you were you were also a victim of this system because you are being forced to participate because it's what is available, right? So that's why I'm saying it's complicit. We need to educate each other. Everybody needs to be aware of it, and we need to take action steps to resolve it. And we need because it's still it's unconstitutional, still to this day. And we're in Harvard. Y'all can help change this. Y'all can y'all can like law students. Y'all can help to change this. And that's what it is. That's what it is. So, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Next question. Oh, sorry, I'm going to have a second. Of the, uh, sorry, the could you? Yeah. So it's not a question. It's, it's more of a request for you to speak to. I'm as someone who's practicing um, since birth. But also the impact that it has on the environment, fashion, mm -hmm. leather. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this goes beyond our own nutrition and food, too. Mm -hmm. But the ethical end of veganism and just the things we do every day without thinking, a wallet, a belt, our shoes, our coat, the down feathers in our coats. Exactly. Maybe you want to speak about that. I thought that'd be great to talk about. Yeah. Um, my boy, shout out, Brave Gentleman. That's actually the name of his brand, Brave, <laughs> Brave Gentleman. And he does uh, vegan leathers and plant-based leathers and things like that, vegan suits. That's what I wore. Yeah, anyways. Um, so, and he's, he's fly. So. But it, like I did, I did some research and looked back in like the history of leather in America, and a lot of the leather, like a lot of the shoes, they still have exhibits with them today. Is like the leather that they were using, where they were like the best leather is the leather of a black black skin leather, and they make shoes, they make their last skin last forever. It's just like the, the Holocaust, how they were making books out of the skins of the Jews and they're making lampshades and all of these things like that. That's what, that's what they did here in America. They would chop the hands off the people that they were lynching, chop them, they would put them up in the windows for display. And, that's, and they were and they're making like leather shoes and leather belts out of the skins of the slaves. Because they said that was the best leather that was available. And they just can't do it anymore because, you know, what did that look like? <laughs> you know, and so, so yeah. So it, it gets, it's really deep what you're talking about and how, like, you know, you can go into how, like, how the animals are treated. They're enslaved, you know, they're, they're, they're like, it's a system. It's, you know, like, we're gonna kill them. Like, there's things like when these, watching these videos, you know, I'm a vegan, you're watching these videos and the cows are in like the line to get killed and they go into the, the, the thing, the door shuts down, bow, 
And then the, the cow that's behind them is flipping out. They're in this, in this tunnel where they can't get move to the left or to the right. And the cow's trying to back up. It's like, Rrr, and crying and trying to back up. And it's like, it's like, man, like this animal knows what's about to happen to them. And it's, it's like, these are sentient beings. They have feelings. They have family dynamics. They understand what's going on. They cry when their family member dies. You know, uh, you guys seen that movie, um, ja, what's that movie? Uh, help me out. Okja. Right. That's what it is. That's real. When we have animals, we have dogs and cats. When you hit them, they feel pain. And then some of these, these doctors or these scientists, they say, oh, animals don't feel pain. How do you know? How do you know? You talking to them? Clearly not. You don't speak the same. You don't speak bark. Like, what's going on? You know? So, all right, next question. Is that it? What's good, bro? I have a crazy question. Um, so I'm an entomologist. I study bugs and plants. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that we're starting to promote is insects as a viable source of protein. I know you mentioned it with the um, tacos, traditional tacos. What do you think about that? Have you heard that? Have you tried a bug burger? Or... <laughs> I've heard of it. It's not exactly something that I do. I stick to the plants and I'm good, you know. Yeah, I was never a fan of that. My grandpa was trying to yeah, take me, drive across. There's a tequila with a worm in it. You want the worm? Mm. No, I'm good, grandpa. I'm straight. So, but it is, it's been in for, 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 since forever, a long time, you know, bugs have been a viable source of protein, not just within humans, but animals as well. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, hey, yeah, this is what it is. <laughs> not my thing, but yeah. So, any more questions? More questions? What? Who? Oh, yeah, the mic. Recording, so if you could wait till the mic. Hi, this is more of a personal question. Um, wondering if you were able to influence any family or friends since you've gone vegan. Have you been able to kind of change your family's mind if they're not vegan? Maybe just uh, have they reduced the amount of animals they've eaten? Uh, my mom did. It's right there. <laughs> and. <laughs> Thanks for coming out, Mom. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Oh, oh, my mom did, and then, oh, go ahead. It's a journey. It's a journey for everybody. You don't know who it is. It's a journey. It's not going to be, I did in one day. It takes time. So, but anyways, is, and you have to be, that's the thing. You have to meet people where they are. Because if you try to force it down your throat, go vegan. You ain't going to get nowhere. They're going to be like, that's a, that crazy vegan person. I don't want nothing to do with them. <laughs> you know, that's how it goes. But, so, but for me, what I do is I just leave, I just, you know, I'm an example. I, I drop these little informational bombs on these people and be like, yo, this was going wrong. Erectile dysfunction, bro. You know, and that, that works. That works. Like, you know, like, so I've gotten a few football players. My boy Daniel Rodriguez, he's also, he played for the uh, Rams, but he also is, uh, he has two Purple Hearts. He was in, he was in the Marines before. He uh, went to the NFL. Um, got shot up and, and, and saved his whole like platoon, his whole everybody, and they were attacked by like 48, it was 48 of them and they were attacked by like 200 people and it was like a straight up gunfight. He was saying his friend was running, uh, and they, they, were, they heard the gunshots in their sleep, got up, him and his best friend, they were like, they were asleep, they got up and his friend ran and he was right behind him and he just hears this, somebody drop behind him and it's his friend who got shot in the head, bow, on the ground, he's dead. But anyways, he has two purple hearts. He's vegan now, and he's speaking on it, and he's a public speaker and everything. And um, uh, my boy Nate, uh, Nate Chandler, he played with the Titans. He was an offensive line. He played with me at UCLA. He's vegan. Call him Big Nate, Nasty Nate. And he has, a, uh, he has a, his whole social media page. My brother played for the Redskins. And his last year, he hit me up. He was like, bro, what are you doing, man? He said, you got the whole offensive line. They vegan over here, man. I'm like... <laughs> That's the sub. That's the win. 
And then the, the Titans, they have 11 players on their team that are gone plant-based and vegan, and I played with those guys too. So it, it's, it's like growing. It's a, it's a huge thing. It's growing. And, you got, and that's not counting the college players. There's a guy on the, uh, he plays for the Jags. He's vegan, and he, you know, everybody's hitting me up. Oh, yeah, let's go vegan. So I'm like, yo, I got you. But so a lot of people are switching over, and because like, you have these guys, and, we, and this goes back to the access to food. These guys who are playing in the NFL and the NBA, they now have the access to the, the funds. The vegan community is known as elitist because it is, right? Because of what I just showed you right now. And you have to have money to buy healthy food, right? And these guys are athletes, football players, basketball players. They, you know, I don't, that's, what, that's where I started doing this, this uh, food justice presentation, a person in the food system, because I was talking and somebody stood up and was like, man, that's all fine and dandy that you, you can eat healthy and you're vegan, but you're in the league. You got bread. You can afford it. Where do you live? I live in the hood. And I was like, you know what? You're right. I'm from South Central, so I understand that. When we were going to the liquor store or the burger shop or Krispy Kreme, that's all we had. It was over here in the area, you know? So, you know, it's, uh, that's just, yeah, that's what it is. Kind of got lost in, on that, but yeah. So people. And just to offer a very mindful observation is that when people of color speak about this because veganism is a privileged identity, um, they're often attacked on social media and attacked publicly when they speak about it by others because there's a very, very interesting dynamic when people of color talk about food justice and how they are viewed as not sticking to the point and that how it's a myth that there's food inequality within these communities. Um, and it gets very, very vulgar and really, really disrespectful as well. So, you know, there are more people that are much like him um, that are talking about these items on a, that have been doing this for like 30 years, 40 years, 20 years, mm -hmm. and they work in communities and they're trying to do this work, but they're largely ignored and not chosen to speak or be present at these facilities or these events because there's so much elitism and white privilege that's steeped into the vegan community. Exactly. There's a Lauren Ornelius. Is she's a TED, she's done TED talks and all that. She's based out of California, San Luis Obispo. She's been doing this for 30 years. Nobody wants to give her any kind of funding. She's funding this whole thing out of her own pocket, trying to teach people about healthy eating and stuff like that in these communities. But nobody wants to give her money because she's also talking about farming, right? And giving the farm, farmers rights. Like there's a Driscoll's company. They there's the fruit company. They wouldn't give. The, the employees a one cent raise on the bag, each bag of, of strawberries or berries that they bring up. One cent per bag. That's it. That's all they were asking for. And they wouldn't give them anything. But in the vegan community, the vegan community doesn't even really see food justice as like, as a thing, you know, as a part of it. But it is because this is, I just told you, they're, these food companies, McDonald's, Burger King, KFC, these companies, they're making literally and figuratively, figur well, figuratively making a killing off of selling their product to these communities of color. Not to mention, they're the number one purchasers of animal products in the world. They're the number one purchaser of cow eyeballs, McDonald's. What the hell are you making with cow eyeballs? So remember that next time y'all order a chicken nugget. It's not really chicken nuggets, it's you eating some cow eyeballs. So you have to... Like it's a it's a whole thing, and like it's all connected, and you have to put the pieces together, and you have to see for yourself. We can no longer live in this out of sight, out of mind mentality, because that's what they're playing on. You have to look under the surface and see what's going on. So uh, over here, hey. Uh, so we've actually had Lauren here a year before last, and she was amazing uh, yeah, in her awesome. talk. But I, following up on that, I wonder if you could talk about some of your own outreach to underserved communities and some of the events you got planned this summer. Most definitely. Um, so I'm doing an event this year. I'm doing, what am I doing, Cam? <laughs> I'm doing an event. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah. I'm building out a plant-based music festival in partnership with, uh, with Summer Stage. And it's, a, it's in five, all five boroughs in Brooklyn. We're starting at Central Park. And it's a, it's a I don't, I'm not, if you guys are familiar with Dave Chappelle block parties, are you guys familiar with that? So it's like five Dave Chappelle block parties happening in all five boroughs, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Staten Island, Queens, and uh, did I miss one? Harlem. Harlem. 
Or the Bronx. Bronx. All right, so we're doing all of that, and it's going to be a block party in all five boroughs. And we're having, last year we had performances from Erica Badu, Anderson Pac, Talib Kweli, Mos Def, who's now Yassin Bey. And uh, is that it? Is that all? Yeah, those are the main ones. And then this year, we have a long list of like a lot of younger artists and more relevant artists that are going to be out there performing. Uh, like I said, we're partnering with Summer Stage, and then we're also bringing it next year to Los Angeles and, uh, in partnership with, uh, can I say that? Well, yeah, potentially with the LA Times. We're in conversation. So we're, it's really growing. It's growing big. And not to mention, I'm doing a documentary. I just signed a, two -year, two, a, doc, a full, feature, full feature documentary deal with Uninterrupted which is LeBron James documentary company, and we're going to be doing it on oppression in the food system. And so, and we'll also be doing a series of shorts interviewing athletes like Kyrie Irving, you know, Jalen Brown, Venus and Serena Williams, Nate and Nick Diaz, these guys talking about their transition to plant-based eating and plant-based life. And I'll be speaking at NYU. And I'll be speaking at NYU. <laughs> yeah. So it's a lot going on right now, and we'll be partnering with Lighter organization for food distribution and we'll be also doing uh, you know to eliminate recidivism and we'll be getting food into the communities and fresh fruits and vegetables in the communities so yeah we're doing a lot doing a lot and we're really trying to make an, an, an imprint make a change in the world we're trying to change the status quo and food in our communities so that's what we're doing so thank you that's another thing. I'm working on that too. Yeah, I'm working. Yeah, I'm working on that too. So, um, but I just started. But what they're doing for that though is that they'll be they're like, you know, they got all that Desert Storm food. They're making the prisoners wear pink, and they're giving them GMO soy. They're like, oh, we're gonna we're vegan now, but they're giving them genetically modified soy products and all these processed products, and it's really not doing anything. There's a story. Somebody was telling me like one of their friends came back from prison, and he, when he left prison, you know, his his breasts were super tender. And it's because he's eating all the soy products that they were giving him because it's GMO soy. GMO soy is different than organic soy. You know, organic soy is actually better for you, and it, it's phytoestrogen, which actually dumps out the excess estrogen that you have in your body. So it's not bad for you, you know, but the GMO soy is really bad for you, and it, it does crazy things to your hormones and, like, makes men lactate and all kind of stuff like that. So, yeah. I mean, I'm just... That's just what it is. That's the prison food. How quickly did you notice the benefits in your recovery time? Immediately. Once you switched over? Immediately. I, was, I told you when I lost 40 pounds, and then I put the weight back on. I was 295, and I was running seven minute miles. I'd get off, wouldn't even bend over. I'd be like, Phew. All right, get back on and run another seven minute mile. And then my trainer at the time, I, we were in Dallas, Texas. That's where I went vegan. Dallas, Texas, barbecue haven, right? And he was like, yo. So after he saw me bench press 465, he was like, hey, so I'm vegan now. And all of my clients are vegan. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, great. And so it was dope. Um, after you made the switch, did the NFL start accommodating you by? providing vegan options, or was it still just chicken? Some teams did. I'm not going to tell that story. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, a lot of, some teams were, the teams are starting to switch. Some teams had, a, they were against it, and they were like, one coach, I'm not going to say what team it was, like, they were like, yo, um, they were like, they didn't know that I was a vegan. And the only people who knew were the players, right? Because I didn't want to cause like a whole bunch of ruckus, and I asked the, the 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 chef, the team chef. I was like, you know, can you just make me some like brown rice and some beans or you know peanut butter jelly sandwich or something simple on the side so I can have something to eat? And and she was like, all right, cool, cool, cool. I come back the next day. Everything vegan, vegan, vegan. This has this much protein in it. This has this much. Oh, I made you a lasagna on the side, a vegan lasagna. I'm like, that. This is, this is dope. This is dope, right? So I'm like, That's, this is great. And then, um, and so, like, the team, they, the players, they were cool with it. They were like, oh, this is good. I mean, healthier. The players actually started coming to me for health and nutrition advice. 
this is the players. These are NFL players. They're like, man, the, co- the, 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 the trainer told me I need to lose like 10 pounds. How do I do it? I want to keep muscle on. I still want to eat good, but I want to, you know, I want to get healthier. If my back is hurting, I want to lose some weight or I might, you know, help get the inflammation out of your system. How do I do it? So they would come to me for help and advice. And I would be like, yeah, 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 you know, I got you, bro. You know, just like I'm dropping drills on y'all right now. Like, yeah, I got you. Easy. And then one day I come into the trainer's room, I mean, into the training hall, I mean, dining hall where all the players are. And I hear a bunch of, ah, right. And then, salute. And then the, um, the, the, the nutritionist is in there and she's handing out these ready-made meals that they give out to the players. So because, you know, players are like, oh, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I don't want to cook anything. I'm going to just heat this up real quick. And they're handing out all of these, these meals. They got chicken and stuff. And the players are like, nah, nah, my boy David said that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> My boy David said that's not good. So, and so they're, they're they're sitting there and they and she's debating with them and he's like so they're like soy milk is bad for you. Oh, and they're like nah, but we drink almond milk. My boy David says drink almond or cashew milk or something like that. Hemp milk. There's all these options. And then she was like and then I walk in there and they're talking about it and they go there goes David right there. Oh, there goes David right there. Hey, get her, get her, get on her. Like, like, and I'm like, I'm like, oh shit. What did I get myself into, right? And uh, and um, the trainer, and she's like, she's trying to debate me, and I'm like, yeah, what's up? She goes, yeah, you drink almond milk and so you know these these milk brands. She's like, that's unhealthy for you because they have Kara. Kara, and I was like, Kara Gian? And she goes, and she goes, yeah, that, it's unhealthy for you. I said, actually, there's two types of Kara Gian. One is made out of, and broke it down, or there's two types of Kara Gian. One is made out of like seed kelp or whatever like that, and that's actually healthier for you. And it's, you know, and that's the Kara Gian that they're using now. But I don't drink the ones with Kara Gian in it. There's different kinds that don't have Kara Gian in it. And that's the brands that I choose. And then she was just like, and they were just like, Oh, how are you the nutritionist and you don't know shit? Oh, and I was just like, and I'm sitting there like, damn. Okay. <laughs> so I go and I leave. And then the next day, the weight coach calls me into the office. And they and it's the weight coach and all the other weight coaches. And they're sitting there. And I'm big as hell. I'm like 305 at the time. And I'm like, and here I'm sitting there like, like, you walk in, I <laughs> get in the room, I sit down. And they're like, so. You're vegan, huh? And I'm like, yeah, what's, what's, is that? Yeah, it's, I'm vegan. And they're like, oh, where do you get your protein from? This is the weight coach. And I'm like, <laughs> I laugh in his face. He goes, why are you laughing? I'm like, bro, you're the weight coach. You don't know where protein comes from? <laughs> and I'm like, they're like well, and they were like, well, I was like, well, look, bro, protein. I was like, I get my, same, my protein from the same place that cows, elephants, gorillas, they get their protein from. Protein comes from, it's, a, it's formed in amino acids through photosynthesis and, you know, chlorophyll. And that's where amino acids are stored. And that's where they get their protein from. So that's where I get my protein from. And then they were just dumbfounded, right? And I'm just sitting there. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go lift weights now. Y'all, y'all cool? Y'all straight? I'm like, all right, cool. The next day, the dude, same dude comes up to me. He goes, hey, uh, the head coach wants you in his office, right? And I'm new on the team. And they're like, and I'm like, shit, okay, well, the head coach wants me in his office. That means either I'm getting promoted or I'm getting fired. <laughs> like, I, and so the head coach brings me into the office, and I'm like, all right, what's going on? And I'm like, how you doing, coach? What's going on? What do you need? He goes, uh, you know, have a seat. He was like, so I hear that you're vegan. And I'm like, yeah. And he was like, oh, we had two players, and, you know, they were trying to be vegan last year, and it didn't quite work out for them. And I was like... Well, I'm not changing anytime soon. You know, I'm vegan. This is just what it is. Like, I'm vegan. You know, this is a lifestyle for me. I'm gonna live like this for the rest of my life. I feel good. I'm healthy. You sure you don't want to consider changing that? Nah, I'm, I'm good, bro. Thanks. And then, and like, all right. And then I was like, shit. I'm probably gonna get so. It's probably gonna be like, all right. I'm gonna see what this comes. The next week, I come. That was Friday. I come back on Monday, and then I go into the the training room, the the, the dining hall area. Nothing, no vegan food. The mashed potatoes got cheese in it. Broccoli has bacon and cheese on it. The there was, the the rice had pork and chicken and all kind of stuff in it. And it's like there was no vegan food. I went to the chef and I asked the chef, I'm like, yo, what's going on? Where'd everything go? She was like, this came from the top down. And she, I was like, I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna go. I'm going to go see if my name is still on my locker, <laughs> right? Because when your name is not on your locker, that means they cut you. So not too long after that, they cut me. 
because and like, I wasn't trying to make any changes. I, was, I wasn't even saying anything. I didn't say nothing. I asked for brown rice and beans, and they changed the entire training hall, tiny hall or because you know everybody else was trying to eat healthier. The players were trying to eat healthier. That team had the most injuries ever. After I left, after they changed, players were slipping discs in their backs, dislocating, all kind of things like that, and they had the worst season that they have ever had, and they already sucked. And so it was, <laughs> so I was like, Hey, that's karma. It is what it is. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I had one last question. I know I asked one earlier. Um, so I'm a debate coach um, mm -hmm. for the Harvard debate team, and we spend a lot of time at tournaments uh, with different topics where these kinds of issues come up. And one of the problems that we run into, and this kind of touches on what you were uh, were talking about earlier, is that the black debaters in the community really resent a lot of the arguments, especially if you try to make any of the kinds of analogies that you do to slavery. They view that as demeaning mm -hmm. uh, slavery. And Who's making the comments? Pardon? Well, uh, white mm -hmm. debaters. That's, and so I, I want to know what your advice is. You obviously have some credibility, I think, in say, giving your message to communities, diverse communities and communities of color that white advocates don't necessarily have. Is there, are there any types of arguments or strategies that you think that somebody who is a vegan or advocating for more, I think, in solutions to the food desert problem can have to gain credibility with um, a black audience that might not be receptive to the message coming from a white person? I think that, honestly, I think white people need to leave it alone and sort of back away. And a perfect example is the dreaded comparison and how that book really rubbed everybody in the community of color the wrong way because she was comparing animal slavery to human slavery. And it's from a white point of view. You know, right. Right. And it's from the white point of view. And it's like, you don't have, you, you, can't, you can't come from that. You have no experience in there. You don't understand. So you're saying things and you're just talking out your ass. That's what it sounds like to us. That's why we're like, be quiet. You have no experience. And one, there was a guy, he was some rich billionaire guy. And he was a Jewish guy. He was like, I came over here. Or, we were Jews. We were gas, this, that, and the other. I said, America came over and saved y'all, brought y'all over here. Y'all are fine. You can, you can, you're a white guy. You can make all kinds of money and be fine. And no one's going to look at you different. You don't have to worry about it. They think you're a white guy. You're a white guy. But, and I was like, you've never experienced slavery, or not slavery, um, oppression or racism in your life. He was like, I have experienced that. I'm Jewish. I was like, no, you haven't, bro. He said, you're not black. They just think you're white. You're not brown. They just think you're a white guy. I said, you saying that you've experienced racism or you know what racism feels like or you can have any kind of relation to racism, it's like me saying, I know what it feels like to push a baby out. I don't. I will never push a baby out. It's not going to happen. It's impossible. You can't experience what racism feels like or know anything really about it because you don't have a firsthand experience. So you need to leave that to people who have a firsthand experience. That's why people get upset, because people are gracing the stage and talking about something that they don't have any experience with. They can't speak on it. This is what it is. So <laughs> I know that you know, the best time to teach someone to help your habits and all that is from, from childhood. And I know that you've been going into schools and, and talking to, to children about you know their eating habits. How receptive are the, are, are how much um, progress have you made in schools? Oh, it's been amazing because people don't really know this history. You know, it's been hidden from us, and really don't want to talk about it because it's going to mess up their bottom dollar, their bottom line. You know, McDonald's don't want people to know that they're making 85 percent of their net profit from marketing to communities of color. How racist does that look, right? Because it is. So it, when you see this and you're seeing how they're attacking your community with things that you can see with your own two eyes, the brick and mortars, I call it the hardware This is in place. The hardware is the brick and mortars in the communities and they're set up. And then you have all of that. And, but what's happening is 
They're saying we're updating the software. The software in this age of information is updating faster than the hardware can ever be updated. So now these signs of racism that are these are these are they're right there. You can see them with your own two eyes. Like I said, can't get rid of them. So this message resonates easily because you hear the information and just like all of y'all gonna hop in your car and you might drive by a hood or something and you're gonna see you're gonna be like damn that's what he was talking about so the message it grows it's resonate it's, it's taking on it's taking off on its own yeah. Yeah, then most definitely. And they're like, yeah, you know, I want to I wanna eat healthier. How do I do it? That's how that one person was like, I stand up. I stood up. They were like, how do I do it? We don't have it in these communities. How can we get these things going? How can we get started? How do we start urban farms? So that's what we're doing. We're starting urban farms and doing all of these things like that and getting them activated. That's another thing we're doing with the festival is that we have, like, uh, cooking demos and we're teaching people or people need more information on how to do things so we're having cooking demos and bringing chefs to show how to cook meals in 15 minutes for under fifteen dollars and doing things like that and so when we do when we are able to get these fresh fruits and vegetables in their hands then they know what to do with them and so yeah all right y'all we are losing the room at 1 30 but David if you could stick around maybe a few minutes if anybody has any other lingering questions we can meet out in the hallway um, so thank you all again so much for coming out again we'll be back in this room tomorrow at noon with our last event of animal law week um, there are sign-up sheets going around for anybody who would like to be notified of our other events and if you could all thank me one more time uh, for David coming out <laughs>